All right. Um, let me get your sign-in sheet passed around. Uh, I know we're starting a little late. Apologies for that. I'm going a little slow this morning. Okay. Um, before we get into the lectures, anybody got any questions about homework four? The very last little bit of the last problem will become clear here in like five minutes. So, but other than that, any questions on the homework? Let's do Wednesday. Are there 16 volts on the first one? Yes. Now, in total, yes. So for bulk shear, yeah. So uh, do we just solve for one plate or do we just solve? Well, it depends on how you want to do that. Um, what you, there's a couple ways you can go about that. Okay. So let's, how thick is the plate? Uh, I think just splice plates, three fourths. Okay. okay, let's just take that as an example. Okay, so remember there's bolt bearing case one, which would be like the wide flange, bolt bearing case two, which would be the splice plate. Right? Okay, so there's a couple ways you can go about that. Um, one method is to say there's four edge bolts. Um, 12 interior bolts and the thickness is three quarters of an inch. You could also say there's two edge bolts, six interior bolts, but the thickness is double. Like you can do that too. It, it doesn't matter just as long as you account for all of them. So it's, it's not as simple as saying, well, is it 16? You know what I mean? Now, for bolt shear, yes, it's 16, because there's 16 bolts total on one end. So you take the capacity of a single bolt and multiply by 16. So it's however you want to do it. You know what I mean? Either way is accounting for all of them, right? Because, or what you could do is you could say two, six, three quarters, and use all of this to get an RN and just multiply that by two. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, just as long as you count for all of them. So. It's a good question. So remember how I said that steel design is a science contingent on bookkeeping? This is one of the things that is what I was talking about. I'd argue that's what makes this problem hard, harder than anything or anything else is the bookkeeping. The math is simple. It's just how do you track making sure you got all of them? I will tell you one thing to set your mind at ease. The bolt bearing capacity ends up being big compared to the other, compared to the bolt shear. So, don't let that freak you out when that happens. Does that make, does that make yeah. sense? Everybody else good with that? This is good stuff. Okay, that's one second. I'm kidding. My goodness. So I can just double the R in. Because I already did it all and I don't want to erase. That's fine as long as you account for all of it. Like, there's, there's no, it's one of those problems where there's no one wrong way to do it. You know what I mean? So. All right, what example were we, was it not example 11 or 10? The last one we did was 11. Okay. Okay. While I'm writing this out, are there any other questions? Okay. Now, let's go back to the problem that we were looking at, because today I want to spend a lot of time talking about welds, but in order to do that, I want to make sure that we're being organized. So, so here's the problem that we were looking at. And remember, when we have a connection that is angled, there, or we have a, a, sorry, a load that is being applied at an angle, that splits our load up into a shear component and a tension component, there are three limit states that we need to assess. There's bolt shear, bolt tension, and the interaction between the two. Okay? So, in other words, here's my bolt, right? So here's my bolt. We're shearing it, so wanting to do that to the bolt. There's bolt tension wanting to yank on it. 
And then there's the interaction of both of those happening at the same time. Now, what I want to put here on this table, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, is I want to put resistance and load. Just to verify that everything's good. And, and I'm doing this for a specific reason, so that everybody is comparing apples to apples. Now, we had started to do this problem. And here, here's the problem that we were working on. Okay. Now, what have we found? Let, let's sort of fill this table in. So, resistance. Okay. So, for bolt shear, we found that each bolt can hold up, what, 22.5 kips per bolt, right? And what did we compare that against? We compared that against the shear load per bolt, which ended up being something like 13. And so the load was bigger than the resistance. Good to go, right? All right, what about bolt tension? Okay, so we got VRNT, and that was 29.8. And then TU per bolt was 18. Good to go, right? The load is 29.8, the tension, or sorry, sorry, the, the capacity is 29.8, the load is 18. Good to go. So what's left is interaction, okay? And that's what we were working on and we didn't quite finish it, okay? So Whenever you're determining your interaction capacity, let's, let's remember how that works. Remember, whenever you have a, a bolt that's in shear and tension, like if you were being analytic about it, there's an ellipse that, that models that behavior. But we say, oh, we don't really like ellipses. Let's use straight line behavior, right? So what we do is we say, okay, we compute the shear stress on that connection and then Based on that shear stress, we compute a modified tensile capacity. Now, in order to do that, you need two things. You need an FRV value and you need your raw material strengths. So this is sort of where we stop. I want everybody to break out their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual. I want you to go back to the spec, to section J3. And I want you to go to page 16.1-129. Okay? Now, remind me. What type of bolts are we using for this problem? Yeah. AX. Group A bolts with the threads excluded. Now tell me, if you have group A bolts with the threads excluded, what is FNT? Now remember, it actually doesn't matter whether or not the threads are included or excluded from the shear plane, because FNT doesn't care about shear. It's a tensile capacity. And what is that? 91. KSI. Now, we have actually never used this table because we never needed to. Table 7.1 and 7.2 had this built into it. This is the first time we've ever had to actually use it. It's actually kind of the last time we have to use it, too. Now, FNB, it's either 54 or 68. Which one is it? It's 68. 68 says when the threads are excluded from the shear plank. So FNB is going to be 68. Yeah. Threads are excluded. So this is table J3.2, 16.1-129. Now, the reason we needed those quantities is because 
we're going to use them in the following expression. So we're using them in this. This is new. We haven't, we haven't used this yet. But remember, we talked about this last time. This is our ellipse bolt interaction expression. So what we're doing is, based on the shear stress, computing a modified FNT. Okay? So this FNT prime. So that is FNT prime, which is the minimum 1.3 FNT minus FNT over V FNB times the shear stress or FNT. And again, all that expression is, is remember that straight line fit? That's just the equation of the line. So 1.3 times 90 KSI minus a fraction. On top of that fraction is 90 KSI times our shear stress, which we computed last time, which is 30.54 KSI and 0 0.75 and 68 KSI or 90. I got, what's that top expression equal? Okay. 
how did we compute this? We said it was phi times FNT prime times AB, right? So what this is, this VRN is a modified tensile capacity. So you compare it against the tensile load, which is in this case 18.0. So this you compare against the shear, this you compare against the tension, but this you compare against the tension because it's a modified tensile capacity. Again, what we do in this expression is we say, based on how much shear you have on it, this is your reduced tensile capacity. We can very easily say, based on a reduced tens or based on the tensile stress, here's a reduced shear capacity. Why do we do it this way? Again, the folks who wrote spec flipped the coin and said, this is how we're going to do it. There's nothing wrong with the other way. This is just it's one or the other. Does that make sense? So comparing this against the tensile load per bolt of 18, that is okay. Connection is adequate. Now, what if the connection was inadequate? How many bolts did this connection have originally? Eight? Was eight bolts or four bolts? Four? Try six. Seriously. Like, just keep adding them by twos. Why by twos? Because if you're yanking on it this way, remember there are two bolts this side and two bolts that side. So if it's inadequate, just try six. If it's too adequate, maybe reduce. So that's basically it. There's, in terms of design, there's really no magic to it. Um, if I was designing a connection like this, I'd probably just set up a spreadsheet. I'd say, okay, what if there were four bolts? What if there were six bolts? What if there were eight bolts? What if there were ten? What if there were twelve? What if there were fourteen? And the first one that works, just go with that. Pretty much. Any questions? All right, you should not only be set on your homework, but that's it for bolts. There's really nothing else to, to talk about in here. So what I want to do for the rest of class today is talk about welds. And I want to try and get through it somewhat expeditiously. Um, so I'm going to highlight the stuff that I think matters. How many of you have ever welded anything before in your life? I'm just curious. Okay, welding is tough, okay, uh, if you've ever done it. Um, I, I highly recommend that you try and take care of doing some welding one time in your life. I can take piece of metal A and attach it to piece of metal B, but if you want a nice pretty weld, you came to the wrong person if you're coming to me. I mean, I've, I've got enough experience that I can do some, some, some welding, but nothing that would, you know, be certified or anything like that. Um, what we're going to talk about, though, here um, is some of the specs and some of the different methods that are used for welding uh, in practice. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention AWS spec, the American Welding Society. Uh, D1.1, which is the welding code for steel, is probably one of the most consulted codes in the world, um, just for all sorts of different fabrication practices. Most of what we do in steel design comes from, from here. We're not going to use it directly because a lot of that comes is, is in the manual. But I thought I'd be remiss if I didn't even uh, mention it. Now, what I want to do for the first little bit is I want to talk about the different welding procedures, the different types of welds, the different welding joints that we use, and then we'll get into the math. And there's a couple things I want, want you to be aware of throughout the welding process. Now, if you've ever done any type of welding or been around welding in general, you've probably heard of like, for instance, MIG welding or stick welding or, or something like that. Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to use a little bit more of a, of a scientific approach to it. Um, and what I want to do is look at the different types of welding methods that are used in structural applications. And the four most common ones that we use are shielded metal arc welding, gas metal arc welding, flux cord uh, arc welding, and then submerged arc welding. Um, those are some pretty fancy terms for some stuff that you've probably seen before, um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll dig into them one by one. So let's start off with uh, shielded metal arc welding. Shielded metal arc welding, uh, welding, you probably heard of that as stick welding, okay? 
So the way that stick welding works, I, I, I assume you all know what I'm talking about or have seen stick welding before. So essentially what happens is your welder has an electrode, a consumable electrode, that's hooked to one end of what kind of looks like a fancy jumper cable. The other end of the cable is attached to the element that's being welded. So as soon as the weld electrode comes into physical contact with the, the piece, you have a, a, a complete circuit, right? And so electricity starts flowing. And so you get a lot of current and amperage right here at that tip. That electrode begins to melt. And so what happens is you have piece of metal A, you have, let's say, piece of metal B. That electrode comes into contact right there. You have a lot of high temperature, a lot of um, uh, uh, melting going on. And this entire joint, when it's all said and done, is melted into one singular piece. Now this little drawing I have on the board is actually horrible because what it does is it assumes that the, the melting sort of just stops here. That's actually not really what happens. What really happens is you're sort of melting all of this and it all becomes one cohesive joint. In fact, if you ever hear the term weld penetration, what that means is how far that melting and that, and that, that heat input penetrates into your base metal. So if you ever hear the term weld penetration, that's what we're talking about. Now, we call this shielded metal arc welding because of the electrode and because of the, um, uh, the chemical composition of it. If you ever see one of these electrodes, and maybe I'll grab one and pass it around in class next time, but essentially what the electrode looks like is, is there's this electrode metallic material inside, and then surrounding it is this granular flux. It's, it's, it's like this gritty sand type stuff that, that's surrounding the, um, uh, surrounding the electrode. When the electrode comes into contact with the base metal, not only do you melt the electrode, not only do you melt the base metal, but you activate that flux. And what that, uh, that flux is doing is it generates this gaseous shield right there at the point of contact. And there's a reason for that gaseous shield. The primary reason for it is to uh, try and eliminate any ambient hydrogen in the atmosphere. In the world of welding, the, the, the number one enemy to a, a, a proper welded joint beyond just you know, appropriate heat input and technique is hydrogen. Because when you get hydrogen into your weld, what happens is it causes your weld to be very, very brittle. Okay? Hydrogen embrittlement is really, really bad. Okay? And that, that causes a, a very significant issue in the strength and the, the performance of a weld. So any time that you're doing any type of welding, one way, shape, or form, you will have not only the electrode, but some either gaseous shield or some flux or some some sort of uh, 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 element that is intended to eliminate or to uh, neutralize the ambient hyd uh, hydrogen in the atmosphere. In the instance of a stick weld, you can see that the weld electrode has this sort of granular flux around it. And whenever it comes into contact, you can see this gaseous shield um, uh, being generated. Now that's a shielded metal arc welding or stick welding. MIG welding, or what we call gas metal arc welding, is a little bit different. How many, if, if you've welded before, I'm just curious, have you stick welded or MIG welded? I'm just curious. Mostly MIG. MIG welding. I, I found MIG welding to be a little easier. That, but then again, people who have done welding or do it professionally tend to think stick welding is easier. I, I don't know. It, it probably just is, is a, a, you know, a, a test, or me testifying to how much of a novice I am. Uh, at welding. stuff, stuff like TIG is a lot better, but yeah. for like sheet metal, MIG works a little better. Well, and yeah, one, uh, so one thing I'll mention, that, like, like TIG welding, you'll never see TIG welding done on large scale structural applications. That's never done. It's, if you've ever, I mean, you, that's almost art at that point, TIG welding. I mean, most, uh, if anybody in here has ever done any TIG welding or seen TIG welding done, Probably your experience with it is in like the automotive industry or, or uh, uh, in, in like machinery type stuff or for buildings and bridges and things like that. We would never do any type of TIG welding. That, that's just, it's not our world. Really, MIG and stick are going to be the, the two primary ones that we use. Now, MIG welding uh, stands for you know, metal inert gas or, or gas metal arc welding. 
The difference between MIG welding uh, and, and stick welding is not only from a technique perspective. When, when you're MIG welding, you have, instead of that little jumper cable that I mentioned earlier, you have this sort of continuous gun. There's a little, little machine that's providing the electrical input, and there's a coil of electrode. And so the little trigger, when you hit the trigger, the electrode comes out. Okay? Um, so as you press the trigger, the weld's deposited. So from a technique perspective, if you're MIG welding, like let's say I'm trying to weld this book to the table, right? So when you're doing a MIG welding, you would just, you know, do that. But if you're doing stick welding, you kind of have to do that because as you're moving left to right, the electrode is being consumed. And then when you get too low, you have to get a new electrode. The reason that we use stick welding in large scale structural applications, sometimes we need some pretty deep and, and significant welds and stick welding is really the only way to generate that level of capacity uh, in as expeditious a manner as possible. Now, when you're using a, a, a MIG welder, typically what will happen is you will not only have the continuous speed of electrode, but you'll also have a tank of gas shield that goes along with it. So if you ever see a, a MIG welding setup, there's the box, and you know, maybe it's like a Lincoln Electric, you know, MIG welder, but then there's also a tank with it. Uh, and you can get that tank filled up from like air gas or, or someplace like that. Uh, and what that, uh, that gas shield is doing is just what the, the flux on the stick is doing in, in, uh, in stick welding. Again, you feed the wire, and once that wire comes into contact with your base metal, you're melting everything. That gas shield is, is doing what the flux is doing. It's trying to eliminate the ambient hydrogen. Okay? So whether you're doing stick welding or MIG welding, you have to have that gas shield. Like if you've ever MIG welded and you don't have the gas, you can tell because the weld looks horrible. Like it looks pitted and bubbly. It, just, it doesn't look right because it's embrittled with hydrogen. So it's a bad deal. Now, you can get around uh, uh, without using the gas shield with a MIG welder if you use a flux cord uh, electrode. How many, if you've ever done MIG welding and you use flux cord or flux covered uh, uh, wire, you can tell because after the weld it looks like white and grainy, like it has this white cloudy look to it and you chip it off. That's what that flux is doing is again trying to, um, to eliminate the uh, the, the hydrogen in the uh, uh, in the area. Now, <clears throat> the one other method that I thought I would mention is what's called submerged arc welding. I guarantee you, none of you uh, have have ever done this, but this is a really common method in in our field because submerged arc welding is very very appropriate when you have a long continuous weld that you need to deposit. So, for example. Um, if you're designing a plate girder, if you will, like on a highway bridge, where's my eraser? So if you're designing a plate girder, let's say, so a plate girder would be instead of like a rolled eye shape, like a like a wide flange, you actually have separate plates. Like this is a plate, this is a plate, and this is a plate, and you're actually welding them together. So you're depositing like a weld here and a weld here, and a weld here. Well, if that girder is like 80 foot long, you need a weld, you know, you need a weld that's like 80 foot long. And so what do you want? Do you want somebody just sitting there doing that for 80 feet? I'd probably try to avoid that. A submerged arc weld gets around that. What, what happens in a submerged arc weld is there's actually sort of two deposits uh, that's going on. Remember, the one thing that you're trying to do is eliminate the ambient hydrogen in the atmosphere. So the first thing that you will see being deposited is this like sandy kitty litter type stuff. And so that's being deposited in front of the well, and then the electrodes trailing behind it so that the arc, the electrical arc that generates the, 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 the welding process is actually submerged under that granular flux, hence submerged arc welding. And so it's sort of done by robot, if you will. Hence why it, it's, um, uh, it, it's really appropriate for long continuous welds. So you can see that's what's happening here. You've got the granular flux being deposited, 
and then the weld is occurring under this. So there's a lot less need for like a visual shield. Like if you've ever seen welding done, don't look at it because those ultraviolet rays will cause damage to your eyes. So, so don't do that. Just a piece of strong advice for, um, for the people in the room. So, so far so good? Okay. Now let's talk about the actual types of welds that you perform. Um, the first and most common weld that you're ever going to learn. So if, if we were down in the machine shop and I was teaching you all welding 101 once we got past the safety element, the first weld I'm going to teach you all how to do is a tack weld. Okay? So everybody heard of a tack weld? If you haven't, a, a tack weld is just a temporary weld that you put in place to get the part where you want it. Okay? So you have, let's say, here's a wide flange and we're welding this angle to it so it can be bolted to a column. So we, we have this, uh, these tack welds. What we would do is we would say, okay, here's the wide flange. We want the angle about, I don't know, right there. And so, just to get it in place. And so let's say if I look at it, I got it in the wrong place, it needed to be over here. Well, I can grind that off and start over. So you always, you know, common procedure is you will tack weld it, measure it again, and then, you know, deposit your full weld. You probably heard the axiom, was it measure twice, cut once? It's kind of like that with welding. You know, tack weld it first, measure it, and then place your full uh, deposit. After that, you get into full-blown welding procedures, and arguably the most common, the most common type of weld that you will ever place is a fillet weld, okay? So a fillet weld, you know, you have, you know, a plate being welded, you know, to another plate. And so a fillet weld would be, you know, sort of striking your electrode in this direction. And ultimately you get a weld geometry that looks something like that. Kind of like this, this bead of weld that you see right here. Um, it, I would say that probably 90% of all welds that we do in structural engineering are fillet welds. So much so that when we do welds in here, like from a design standpoint, we're only going to do fillet welds because you can build an entire, you could build this entire building with fillet welds, the whole building, okay? So the only other, I guess, I guess class of fillet welds might be what's called a stitch weld. And all a stitch weld is just, you know, these short little increments of, of fillet welds. But again, fillet welds are the most common the second most common um, weld that you would see is what's called a groove weld. Um, now, you probably will never hear the term groove weld from a fabrication perspective. What you will probably hear are things like full pin weld. You might hear CJP or PJP. Um, a, P, a CJP would stand for complete joint penetration. PJP would be partial joint penetration. Um, but when I'm talking about the term full pin weld, I'm essentially talking about a weld that fully penetrates the entire thickness uh, of the plate. The idea is that if I have plate A and plate B, I basically just fill that whole darn thing with weld metal such that I'm fully developing the capacity of the, uh, the plate on either end. And that's what a, a, a groove weld is. So if a fill weld is really just intended to form a, just a connection between two elements, a groove weld is really trying to create one cohesive part out of two individual pieces, either through complete joint penetration or partial joint uh, penetration. And so what you might, like a common detail is you might find the edge of this plate, you know, ground to a specific angle and this ground to a specific angle and just fill it, uh, fill it all the way up. Between that and fillet welds, that is the bulk of what we do in structural engineering by a, by a large margin. Plug welds or slot welds, so if you have a plate on top of another plate, you drill a hole and fill that hole with weld metal, uh, that could be a plug weld. They're not very common. They are used maybe in like transmitting shear, for instance, in a lap joint or trying to prevent buckling, uh, but not, not as, as common. Um, and, and really in structural engineering, that's about it. I mean, there, there are some other instances where we might have some other welds, but that's pretty much it for, for welding in structural engineering. As for the different types of joints that we use, so the welding joints, uh, that corresponds to how you place your plates together. 
So we've already dealt with lap joints in here where we have a plate left on top of another. We did that for bolted connections. Um, that, that would be a lap joint. A butt joint would be two, point, two plates butted up against one another. Uh, a T joint would be you know, a plate and another plate uh, in that type of geometry, kind of like a web and a flange. That would be a T joint. Uh, corner joints, you know, uh, straightforward. Uh, and edge joints if you've got two plates parallel and you're filling in that, uh, uh, that given edge. Uh, what we'll pro uh, primarily deal with in here are things like T joints, lap joints, so on and so forth. Sound good? Okay. I'm going through this kind of fast because all the notes uh, are here. Um, this, this slide is talking about the weld position. Um, this is of most import, I would say, to the fabricator. Um, if you're trying to weld piece of metal A to piece of metal B, um, what is of import to the fabricator is welding that in a comfortable position. Um, in the world of structural engineering, sometimes some of the welding needs to be done in the field. And if that's the case, your welding position does matter. I can tell you that I have, well, I have personally done vertical welding before, and it is much more difficult than welding in a flat or horizontal position, at least just from my perspective. And doing overhead welding is probably some of the most difficult and most dangerous, because you're literally melting steel above your head. Do I need to you know, explain why that's dangerous? You know? um, so as a structural engineer, you should just keep in mind that if you're designing a system and you can avoid overhead welding or vertical welding, do that, okay? Because that's just going to make your, your fabricator's life uh, a lot more e uh, uh, easy, and it's ultimately going to result uh, in a weld that has better quality assurance, quality control, uh, et cetera. Okay, now, how many of you have ever seen, like, a drawing with weld details on it? How many of you have ever seen that? Like, a fabrication drawing show, shows all the weld details. If you go into the world of structural engineering, you will. And it can get real complicated real quick. All of the different symbols where you know, this is a plug weld, this is a fillet weld, what's a field weld, so on and so forth. That is, I am not expecting you to remember that at all. Okay? What I do want you to recognize, though, are some very, very basic welding terminology symbols. Okay? And so, I want to show you some, some welding terminology that I do want you to be able to identify. Okay? So, all right. Okay. Let's say I have plate A and plate B. Okay? And I want to weld them together. Okay? Now, the way that we as structural engineers specify that is as follows. Let's say that this dimension right here is a quarter of an inch, okay? which is a very common weld size. All right? What we would do is we might say that that is quarter inch weld, it is a fillet weld, and maybe it's six inches long. That is common weld detail, that, that is common terminology. Okay? The only other thing that I might want you to recognize, and it will become clear here in a second, is if I put a little flag right there, that indicates that that weld is to be done in the field as opposed to in the shop. So like if we're talking about a bridge, if I put that flag there, that meant I would want you to weld that on the site as opposed to in the fabrication shop, which is very rare. We, we probably wouldn't do that. But on some buildings, maybe that is a possibility. So that's really the only terminology I want you to understand other than maybe this. So if I put the triangle down here, that indicates that the weld is on the side of the arrow. If I put it on both sides, that means it's on both sides. So does that make sense? So this isn't really the best joint to describe that, but maybe if I had this. So if I had you know, something like that, 
then it would indicate the weld is here. If I had something like that, it would indicate the weld is here. And both means both. That's the only terminology I want you to understand. That's it. Because we could get real fancy with that terminology real quick. Alright. Sound good? Alright. Now, I'm going to show you something funny because I can't help it. Now, if there's anything I want you to learn about wells, it's that the location of the weld along the joint matters. And if there's any one place that you don't want to place a weld, it is when it's experiencing transverse load. We'll talk about why next time, but you'll kind of get an idea uh, of this. This is from a guy named Dwayne Miller. He's the chief of research at Lincoln Electric, so he knows welding. Um, I'm actually going to stop the recording because I don't know about copyright and all that, but, um, but you'll get a kick out of this. This is...